I'm very happy to be moderating uh, such an amazing, uh, at such a great university, uh, and I am honored to, to be talking about the future of, uh, of architecture in education, research, and practice. Uh, I think it's quite imperative for us to start thinking about how we can develop our future, how can we look at different uh, forms of architecture as a means to discuss uh, social strata and social formations. Uh, so the way I'm framing, so today we're going to talk about um, uh, the role of architecture, the role of mapping and documentation in the realm of architecture. Um, the way I'm trying to, uh, to frame it is through cartographic narratives. So ma the role of mapping and documentation takes this um, uh, form of a narrative throughout history. Uh, yes, we're talking about the future, but I'd like to roll back a little bit to the past and then uh, have the story of how mapping and documentation unfolded into, uh, some, into our contemporary understanding of the world around us now. Um, so I'm going to start with one of the earliest human settlements, or it's believed to be one of the uh, uh, oldest human settlements made by the Assyrians. Uh, it's in Nasla in Taima, uh, uh, northwest of Saudi. Uh, it, is, it is believed that it's, uh, they are drawings that are made by Assyrians. I don't know if this has a laser. Anyways, so as you can see, there's, um, uh, there's stone carvings that are done by, uh, by the Assyrians on this rock uh, that is perfectly split down the middle. But uh, what really amazes me is that um, we, have, we have certain drawings that depict a story. And that's one of the earliest forms of documentation is stone carving or stone painting, uh, drawing on caves. Uh, certain societies in the past used to document uh, things about their culture. So they almost become like cultural artifacts. And how do we look at these art, uh, uh, cultural artifacts uh, throughout history and its development? So uh, after that, I'd go again to stone carving by uh, al Farana uh, in ancient Egypt and uh, some stone painting in Indonesia. It's also, it's kind of like a, another form of documenting uh, their daily lives, spiritual rituals, uh, uh, life and death. All of these things have been a part of human thought uh, since the dawn of time. I would then move on to uh, the Parthenon in Athens. You'd see the pediment uh, uh, Greeks would manifest their ideas through sculpting and architecture, and you can see really the stories uh, and narratives of different, uh, different, uh, I would say Greek mythology uh, that made its way into the architecture and its way into uh, this document documenting um, a lot of ideals and things that kind of differentiate the Greeks and and made them who they are. Um, or made them who they were back then. <clears throat> and then move on to, to this introduction of the idea of cartography and map making. Uh, it was, map making was a means of, of deciding trade, uh, war strategies, uh, mapping out cities, but in a very informal manner. One of the very first, uh, one of the very first extensive maps was uh, the Tabula Rajriana. Uh, made by Muhammad Idrisi in the 12th century. Uh, and you can see directly how that starts to transform from something that really says uh, something about the society as a cultural artifact, but then it starts moving on as a more of a mapping process. So documentation becomes more uh, mapping out the world around us, understanding the world around us. Um, and then uh, Rene Descartes, uh, the f uh, philosopher and mathematician introduced the Cartesian system in the, in the 17th century. Uh, that really, um, I think it's something imperative in, in during the Renaissance because it's, it's something that changed human thought. We started to notice that the world around us is a set of points uh, in, in, a, in a theoretical space. Uh, and we can identify that every single city, every single point in the world uh, is according to a grid. And that kind of begins yet another sort of metamorphosis of mapping and documentation because it becomes more about data collection and understanding the world around us in a very scientific manner 
uh, that kind of unravels itself through uh, technological means, whether it was through pen and paper back then or through calculators now, computers, uh, mapping out facades. Uh, you have a project by UN Studio, they're building this project in Dubai. Uh, it's the tallest ceramic structure and then you have um, Akeem Mendez with his uh, structure on the right. So parametric structures. So from, from mapping out cities to, to mapping out facades of architecture and, and through mapping out uh, modular systems, it becomes this whole idea of mapping and documentation throughout history just becomes more and more fluid and it applies itself to different surfaces, whether these surfaces are architectural, social, or uh, based on geological uh, formations it really becomes something that's fascinating. Uh, and I think it's really, really re relevant to the topic of today about the future of architecture in terms of design, research, uh, and education. Um, and then it kind of, what I find interesting, um, I, I know Ahmed didn't make it today, but he's a dear friend of mine and I really admire his book, Desert, uh, Desert of Faran, uh, as I think it really represents this uh, kind of, forward-looking but rolled back to collecting cultural artifacts. You also have a lot of artists that use photography. So the role of mapping and documentation takes its way back from the artist's eye or the architect's eye in terms of documenting certain views. Like you have like James Terrell uh, documenting light, uh, light tunnels coming in, but then you have people like Ahad Matar uh, kind of saying something about uh, the transformation of Mecca in a very artistic fashion, but uh, what, what really fascinates me is that it kind of, it wasn't inside of the gallery walls, but it refits itself in almost an academic book that has an artistic kind of connotation, uh, socio, political, economic, all of these things. So it kind of merges all of these things into one. Um, and that's really, it's, it's this kind of fluidity that mapping and documentation uh, that I think we should be looking at in, in the world around us today. Um, that's, that's all I have to say for now. Uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, the great speakers that we have with us today. We have uh, Dr. Hisham Murtada. Uh, um, he's a doctor in uh, Jamaat al Malik Abdelaziz, King Abdelaziz University, and he's uh, lectured in different parts of the world. He works, yeah, his interests vary between heritage and tradition, uh, and of course, uh, within an architectural framework. Uh, we also have um, Dr. George Richards. George Richards. <laughs> uh, he's, the, he's the head of heritage projects at Art Jamil, doing a lot of stuff around Al Balad. Um, and it's just amazing to see this progression of, uh, of how uh, this educational process is about tradition and heritage, yet it kind of manifests itself in preservation and restoration. Uh, it's just multifaceted, and it's just great to see this, these sort of things happening uh, in Jeddah. I'm from Jeddah. And I really am uh, constantly fascinated by this uh, interesting transformation that's happening within people's minds about how to treat the old quarter of Jeddah al Balad. Uh, then we have um, Basma Kaki. Uh, she has a, she is a co-founder of Studio Bound. It's a research lab. Uh, Basma is also running Mecca versus Mecca which is uh, an architecture association uh, visiting school that takes uh, students around Mecca to document the city itself, which I think these three panelists really bring um, uh, a connection and a, a, a link with each other. I think each of them will speak in a very uh, interesting way that interweaves with, with the subject that we're talking about today, whether it was the role of mapping and documentation or the future of architecture. Uh, within the realm of education, research, and design. Um, so I would like to uh, invite Basma to start. Um, it's going to be kind of like a narrative about um, going throughout different scales of architecture. So we'll go with Basma, uh, uh, George, and then Dr. Hisham.
turn on? Okay. Um, so I'd like to start by thanking Jawahed for inviting uh, Studio Bound to participate in this panel discussion and Dar al Ulum initiative. Um, and I'd also thank you, Abdurrahman, for the introduction. Um, as Abdurrahman mentioned, um, I'm founding partner of Studio Bound, a multidisciplinary design practice that operates both as a design studio and a research lab. Um, and it is our research. the slides. There you go. Um, is it working well? Um, and it's a research effort in collaboration with the Architectural Association School of Architecture in London that brings me here today. In 2015, we teamed up with AA in launching the Jidda Visiting School titled Mecca versus Mecca, um, a research platform and workshop with an overall ambition to compile a body of research um, on an archive library in Mecca, the city, and what lies beyond the Holy Mosque. Uh, to record and represent both the visible and the invisible landscapes of uh, Mecca, as it undergoes an important period of rapid construction and transition, um, in an aim to gain deeper urban, architectural, and social understanding of Mecca. So um, what initiated this project are the complex realities and wealth of information in undocumented Mecca. We explore its narratives as mosque, city, and symbol. There you go. Um, mosque, city, and symbol to question and consider what could become of the holy city, what, uh, could, what shapes it, and ultimately constitutes its identity. Our approach to mapping merges analytical archiving with uh, speculative analysis in an attempt to understand this unique urban case study where liturgical worship and cyclical rituals choreograph the activities in daily life. Um, the role of mapping becomes more than just a tool of representation here. It, becomes, it evolves to become an instructive platform, um, a threshold to trigger design. The first of our presentation, uh, I'll start by presenting our archive books which are the analytical part of our research, and then I'll move on to the speculative drawings. Um, so far, we defined and documented four key urban areas of Mecca in its entirety, uh, to, to understand Mecca in its entirety, starting with, obviously, the Haram, um, and then uh, moving on to al Sharashif. So the routes highlighted are the areas we covered when we started collecting the data. Um, and then from al Sharashif, we moved to al Hujun and then Ms. Bella. So 
So to present an analytical medium, we standardize the microscope through which we witness and study these areas, um, finding a common vocabulary for evaluation, uh, with a repetitive and rigorous research method applied to the scope of their urban makeup. Uh, we divided the archiving process into four categories of research, inhabitation, materiality, fenestration, and social group. Plotting a grid across the entire map to retain a structural order for the data collected from descriptive texts, photographs, drawings, allowing us to easily refer back to the map, forming connections between our findings. And it is through this uniformity of our method the diversity of Mecca is actually understood. We archive and map Mecca in 2D as well as in 3D form uh, with strong emphasis on learning through doing and exploring. And as such, we actively engaged with the holy city through curated walks uh, that were diverse in perspective, um, collaborating with artists, historians, uh, developers, and architects. Uh, what was evident through this body of research was that there was a distinct boundary between Mecca that the pilgrims experience and the one that the locals or the residents experience. Um, so we trekked into this invisible yet very strongly felt present boundary in the city. Working as I previously showed from the urban scale and zooming into physically modeling the architectural typologies emblematic of each zone. Um, reading the city as a taxonomy of objects. So we're reimagining the city through its interior spaces. Um, casting, ooh, ooh, what did I do? Casting one to five plaster models of uh, Qasr al -Sakaf, the unplanned settlements of Al-Sharashif, and Kuwer Palace, and finally the hotel room. Um, these are all interiorized experiences that are trademarked and becoming an essential benchmark of what is to experience Mecca. Uh, what we aim to get across is, um, through Ayya Jidda, is the value in documentation, research, and critical dialogue equal to that of design. And uh, now moving on from these, progressing from these analytical archives as the base for all our research, we then move on to the speculative drawings, where these are, um, the, the output is charted across vignettes or windows into the city that aim to connect the city to its uh, prospect. So, um, so um, the, therefore, these drawings take in materiality beyond the typical technical architectural drawing, but uh, convey, uh, tr they try to capture a, uh, uh, a coupling between everyday behavior with uh, an architectural organization where this becomes an evidence of a way of life, uh, capturing the essence of a city and its inhabitants that isn't solely defined by its built form. The first of our vignette um, uh, focuses on the sensorial qualities of the mosque, of the city actually. One's perception, and, one's perception and memory of a place is deeply rooted in the sensory experience of that place. Um, light and sound play an instrumental role in documenting um, how a city formulates. So everyday events, seasonal transformations of the Islamic city are highly affected by light and sound. So what we did was, there was we understood how it's an integral parameter to understand the city as a mosque uh, and its function through the sensorial qualities, and that was crucial when discussing the identity of Mecca as a city. So only 500 meters away from the extremely well-lit harem is the unplanned settlements of Al-Sharashif. A highly dense cluster of houses uh, sits in a form of incompletion um, on, top of, on top of a hilly terrain uh, where narrow roads are only lit with uh, storefronts and lights of moving cars. In order to invest into these behaviors, we, through a specified language, translated the quality of space in relationship to light and adopted a vocabulary where documentation, we started to document the irregular intensity of light um, captured in the horizontal axis while vertically the area clearly was completely dim. Um, here, architecture serves and becomes a vehicle for observation and perception. Um, reflecting everyday reality, providing a format for a specific social life. So Mecca, through these maps, begins to present an urban quarrel, a, a tale of two cities, where the lightness of day casts shadows of distinction, 
and uh, the darkness of its skies provides a microscope into the status quo. Evident in uh, the next uh, vignette where the concentration of artificial light is focused on the arteries of the, to the Grand Mosque and the mosque itself. Um, uh, in, this is Ibrahim Al Khalil Road where the Jab new Jabal Omar development is located. So Mecca's diverse physical and social landscapes are heightened through this additional dimension. Uh, if light presented difference, then sound presented unity. Stand, sound stands as the marker of time, uh, signaled through Adan, that summons all Muslim to prayer, uh, a common denominator across the urban domain of Mecca. So uh, the following drawing presents a documentation we did of the projection of Adan from the minarets of the mosque across to the entire city. Um, the bottom scale refers to time, uh, while the up the, the scale at the top is the distance and uh, the occurrence of time, Adan five times a day. So the Adan can be heard up until 1,000 meters away from the Haram. So the consistency of, Azan, uh, of uh, the Adan and the sound projections of it stands in contrast to the narratives relayed by the night skies of Mecca. The vignettes are both a construction and a deconstruction of the city. And through the vignette Mecca, city as a mosque, we tried to challenge the notion of what constitutes a sacred boundary, far beyond the immediate boundaries of, a great, of the Grand Mosque. Highlighting the city's flexibility, it seasonally shifts in function to, post alternative, to host alternative urban transformations. Drawing a nolly plan of Mecca, which debates the clash of classification of space from public versus private, um, secular versus spiritual. The mosque and the spaces that transform to house liturgy are all in white, while the rest is shaded in black. We also catalogued sectional plans of the mosques across the entire city, the different typologies of the mosques, their origins, their seasonality, uh, their users, and relationship to their surrounding, whether they sit prominent, prominently in the middle of a district or they're part of a house, uh, a house that was transformed into a mosque as part of the unplanned nature of some of the areas uh, in uh, Mecca. So these drawings combined start to denote a condition and of the area and its inhabitants. By looking at the city as both found and imagined and through the un unearthing of these um, objects and knowledge that are embedded in the city, relations among different elements start to form connections and give rise to new meanings. So what we could what could, help us be, what could help us become sensitive to this experience the sacred city offers? And in this rapid stage of the city's development, um, the elements often most vulnerable to the forces of urban erasure, the ones that are seen as archaic, can often be the most valuable point to trigger progression. Uh, through our documentation and mapping process, um, we hope to develop a platform and guide that uh, is not restrictive or merely preservative represent representation, uh, but um, can become a tool, an instructive tool for design, promoting further analytical dialogue and an important tool to understand the complexities of the city in order to design for it. Thank you. Vitma for such a great uh, insightful talk about uh, Mecca, which I'm sure is a place that's dear to us all. Um, I would like to uh, invite George Richards uh, onto the podium uh, to tell us a little bit what, about what they're doing in Bennett and possibly other places. Well, I'll just start by um, thanking Jawahir and uh, Dar al uh, Ulum uh, Initiative and, uh, for inviting Al Jamil and me. And thank you, Abdurrahman, for the introduction. And uh, apologies that I 
was, uh, I've missed a couple of days, but uh, like Abdurrahman, we've been very busy at Al Jamil with 2139 um, Arts Festival in Jeddah, um, which included an exhibition of works at the Jamil House of Traditional Arts in Al Balad, which will feature in the presentation right now, and is around the corner from Beit Al Khunji, where Abdurrahman's uh, Brick Lab has a, has a wonderful exhibit as well. So I'm going to speak a little bit um, along a similar vein to what Basman was describing about documentation of heritage in Saudi Arabia, in this case, particularly endangered heritage. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, Art Jamil is uh, an arts and culture institution based in uh, Jeddah and in Dubai. Um, and heritage is perhaps the least known of our activities, but is one of our four pillars. Um, we have a mission to integrate both traditional, active, traditional arts and uh, very innovative digital approaches to protect and preserve all cultural heritage, tangible and intangible, and particularly to do that um, in partnership with local communities. Uh, we have three institutes, one in Cairo, one in Jeddah, which opened in 2015, which I mentioned just now, the Jumil House of Traditional Arts Jeddah, and one opening in Scotland soon. And those are all in collaboration with the Prince's School of Traditional Arts. Um, and I think as uh, uh, Abdullah Sheikh mentioned earlier, the Prince of Wales is very interested in these issues of urbanism, architecture, and heritage. And as part of our heritage program, we do a lot of research working on policy issues, including with major institutions. For the project I'm gonna to describe today, we worked with um, an institution called the Factum Foundation for Digital Technology and Conservation. They were our partners. They're based in Spain. They were founded in 2009, and they work with um, high-resolution uh, digital recording of cultural heritage and also in the rematerialization of heritage, especially when it's been lost or destroyed. In the top right corner, you can see, um, and in the bottom right-hand corner, those are facsimile copies of pieces from Ashanasapal's palace in Nineveh in Iraq, which have since been destroyed uh, in the conflict in the last few years with uh, Daesh. Uh, and they've been restored through digital, digital means based on copies that were fortunately made before their destruction. In the bottom left-hand corner is a piece from Palmyra, which again has been destroyed but restored. And in the middle, in the bottom row, is uh, part of the facsimile copy of Tutankhamun's tomb in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Today, if you go to the Valley of the Kings and you go to visit Tutankhamun's tomb, you don't actually go into the real tomb because it was being so badly damaged by human visitation. Uh, now you walk into a facsimile copy, which to the human eye is entirely indistinguishable from the original, both in terms of surface quality and in uh, accuracy of, rep uh, of reproduction. The importance of high-resolution resolu high data cannot be underestimated in the, in, in the realm of heritage protection, especially where heritage is severely at risk and endangered. Um, and with this in mind, we focused on uh, a number of, or four key points in our joint project. The first was to identify two major, but also endangered elements of Saudi heritage. One was um, Ghat, al Ghat al Asiri, in, uh, in southern Saudi Arabia, and the other were the traditional houses of al Balad in Jeddah. Both have been inscribed by UNESCO in their lists of world heritage. Uh, al Balad in 2014 into the world heritage list, and al Ghat just at the end of last year into the list of intangible heritage. We also decided to pioneer new technologies, many of which had not been used in Saudi Arabia before, in our documentation, our high resolution recording. That included laser scanners, but also new equipment that the Factum Foundation has, has developed over the, over the years. We focused on capacity building, so we made sure that beneficiaries of our project were, were Saudis. And we trained people in, uh, in Jeddah in the use of the technology, in the use of skills such as photogrammetry, which is a systematic recording of, um, of, of an object using conventional photography, but at very high resolution, and also the processing tools for building three-dimensional models. And then all of the output of our project, we made open access. So you can find 3D models on Sketchfab, which is the kind of YouTube of 3D modeling. Um, you can find more information on our website, and you can just find me at Archimel, and we'll provide it, because we want this to be used for research. 
So the two sites were Al Balad in uh, Jeddah and Asir, especially the town of uh, Rajal Al Ma and other small towns and abandoned settlements in Asir. Uh, Al Ghat, as you may know, is this fantastic geometric and colorful form of mural painting, traditionally done by women, which decorates the interiors of houses in the, in the hills and mountains of Asir. Uh, its meaning is the subject of much um, artistic and academic debates, but tragically, many of the older pieces are in a dire state of disrepair, often because villages have been abandoned uh, as populations have migrated and moved around the region, or simply because they've been neglected and we decided to focus on some of the oldest pieces. We recorded one room which was around 200 to 250 years old and is probably the oldest extant example of a gut which only uses three colors, black, white, and red, a kind of dark, dark red, all made of natural pigments. Whereas the more recent examples like this here, and this is even 100, 150 years old, are much more colorful. And sadly, since we did this project last year, 2017, some of the sites that we visited have since been lost. They've either, the buildings have collapsed or the uh, murals have, have, have fallen from the wall uh, in fragmentation. The other was, of course, uh, El Belad, which I'm sure many of you know, and the beautiful tower houses of coral stone, some of which are in a sad state of disrepair today. Some have been beautifully restored, um, but many are in need of urgent attention. So we started off, as I mentioned, by training um, local Saudis who were interested in uh, photography and heritage. Uh, this is here in our center in Al-Bala, the Jameel House of Traditional Arts, Jeddah. Uh, we trained around 15 women. Uh, and then we deployed into the field. And so we worked in groups um, photographing systematically. And photogrammetry is really is more of a skill than a technology but um, when applied correctly can, can yield incredibly high resolution results, almost as good as laser scanning. And here the, the ladies are scanning a beautifully carved wooden door. Um, and here uh, the mihrab of um, the mosque, Shif'i Mosque in uh, Al Balad. And we, we cataloged a lot of the um, fine Egyptian carved pieces with the ladies and then using laser scanning in the factum team, we looked at some of the more endangered pieces which required slightly more precarious uh, setups. So we then built the point cloud, and this is just a, a slide to show you um, the process of building these 3D models and, and conflating all of those photographs. In the bottom right-hand corner, all those um, tetrahedrons are indications of where the photographs were made. And layer upon layer of photographs build up thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands, even millions of photographs build up this layer of, um, of image which has the resolution necessary to be able to reproduce them even in three dimensions through additive manufacturing, etc. And then once you have that, you can build these um, three-dimensional models, these kind of dioramas, if you want. And this is a facade in El Belad, um, which we built based on the ladies' photogrammetry. And so we have even more high definition, but I wanted to show you something that had been done by, by the people that we trained. And uh, you, know, you can get into extremely high close-up. And again, this is all available on Sketchfab, the so-called YouTuber 3D models, which is a great resource for people looking to study um, these buildings. And so, with all of this in mind, we, we tried to think about how we can use this data. And uh, Abbasman just now gave a great example of the way in which you can build layers and layers upon data, and publications of research is one important way to make this information available to scholars and to architects and people interested in urban planning. Um, we want, as I said earlier, we made all of our data open access, and we're looking now for opportunities to collaborate with academics and to inform a new generation of preservation of al-Balad and also of Asir and important aspects of Saudi heritage. Rematerializations, that is basically reproducing the heritage in different ways. So um, we've done 3D models, for example, of gypsum panels from al-Balad that we recorded, which we give to our students in the Jamil House of Traditional Arts 
to work with while they learn how to redo that gypsum carving. So at the minute, oftentimes, if they want to learn about how to design a gypsum panel, they have to climb a ladder with a piece of paper and a charcoal and take a rubbing, bring it back down, and then study it. They can do that, of course, and we encourage them to be out in the field, but we can also provide them with a 3D printed exact copy at the highest definition of the original panel, which allows them to hold it in their hands and feel it, rub their hands over it as many times as they want, and really engage with the artifacts. And of course, if that building or that gypsum panel were tragically ever to be destroyed or to be lost, we would be able to instantly rematerialize it through this 3D printing process. But we've also thought a bit more outside the box, and so I was just down in Abha two weeks ago for the ceremony to mark the inscription of al uh, al Asiri into the UNESCO list of intangible heritage. And we presented a tapestry, which you can see here. And this tapestry, made of you know, textiles, linen, was a perfect copy of a gut wall that had been scanned as part of this project. And a number of people seeing the tapestry for the first time came up to me and asked what paints I had used, what kind of plaster I was using. But of course, it was on textiles, and until they touched it, they couldn't believe their eyes. And so these are all just examples. At the minute, we're just experimenting with different applications of the data. And then finally, for us, one of the most important aspects of the program, of the project that we did, was the training in these skills and these technologies for people here in Saudi Arabia and to popularize their use in heritage preservation. And as we look ahead into the future, that's the, uh, the key area that we want to expand on and will hopefully continue to run these training programs in Jeddah and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. I think it was really interesting to hear about this uh, uh, materialization of uh, certain artifacts into becoming something that's more tangible. Uh, it was quite fascinating. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Hisham Murtaba. Uh, he has a, a vast amount of research about things that are happening around the country in terms of heritage and culture. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon. I'm pleased to be with you. I'm, uh, I appreciate that. I, I appreciate the invitation that I have from Jawahir and her colleagues. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, a project that we carried out for three years at King Abdul Aziz University. During these years, we uh, uh, documented traditional architecture of uh, more than 100 uh, cities, uh, towns, villages, and so on throughout the country. Uh, it was uh, a historic uh, experience for me and for my colleagues, as well as the students. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, it, uh, it took us three years to document everything uh, in this country, and we really uh, are proud of it. Okay, uh, well, uh, the first image, you know, yesterday someone, or there was a discussion about Islam, uh, sustainability, and the West. So I recommend for that topic, you know, to read this book, which I wrote uh, uh, 15 years ago. It discusses uh, the stand of Islam toward uh, uh, sustainability uh, and the West, uh, or the Western notion of sustainability. Uh, this book was published in 2003 by Rutledge, New York, and uh, there was a second edition uh, uh, produced 2013. Uh, the name of the presentation is Removing the Dust because everywhere we went uh, to, we were removing the dust. Uh, there were ruins, there were uh, you know, uh, deteriorated houses, settlements, 
uh, empty places that nobody were there, and we had to dig and find the origin and the stories, the architectural stories behind uh, these places. Uh, in 2009, uh, King Abdulaziz University signed a, a scientific uh, exchange agreement with the Technical University of Vienna to participate in research uh, aiming to document traditional architecture of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the aims well, were uh, technology transfer, documenting traditional architecture of Saudi Arabia in terms of space distribution, external treatment, construction materials, uh, and techniques, influencing factors, and so on. Uh, the VUT, uh, the Austrian team responsibility was training KAU's uh, students and faculty members on the use of latest technology, uh, 3D laser scanning in particular, of documenting historic buildings in Jeddah. And KAU team's responsibility was uh, documenting traditional architecture throughout Saudi Arabia, except Jeddah, where we work together. And uh, the project uh, period was three years, started May 2011. The achievement was surveying the traditional architecture and urbanism of 108 cities, towns, villages, and settlements in Saudi Arabia. And uh, there were more than 60 students participated in the pro this project, as well as uh, uh, 25 faculty members. We divided uh, the country into uh, four regions. You know, we know that uh, Saudi Arabia consists of three, uh, 13 administrative uh, regions or emirates, but we divided them into five regions in, in terms of geography as well as uh, environment. We have the coastal uh, region along the Red Sea. We have the south region, the central region, uh, east and north. And these are the survey cities and settlements uh, in the project. Uh, in the Red Sea, we uh, surveyed 13 uh, cities and towns, Jeddah, Mecca, Medina, Taif, Yambo, Omluj, Al Wajdaba, Al Wala, Al Kunfada, Beni Harith, Beni Saad, and Bisan. In the southern region, we surveyed 25 uh, cities, villages, and towns. Uh, this is the last. And the central region, which was huge for us, and consisted of Riyadh, Hail, and Qasim, we surveyed 47 uh, cities, towns, villages, and settlements. Uh, Eastern province, eight. Uh, northern region, 11. And we worked in uh, both scales, urban and architectural. Uh, the techniques we used, uh, 3D laser scanning, city analysis, conventional means of uh, observations, measurement, drawing, and sketching, photography, video taping, GPS and thermal assessment, uh, interpretation, oral history, and local resources. And uh, Trabaza was the nickname for the, the, for the Jeddah part, where we worked with the Austrian colleagues, and we worked for uh, one month. We, uh, we rented an old house uh, in the city, and we worked day and night uh, with students to laser scan two houses, uh, Norwali House and uh, a Nawar House. So during that time, the one month, the students and faculty members learned, learned how to use 3D laser scanning, and they documented the two houses uh, there. Then, you know, uh, the team, the Saudi team went to, to, to the rest of the project. Uh, we started with city analysis uh, for each town we visited to, uh, of the 108 uh, uh, sites. Uh, we uh, tried to find out uh, the urban configuration, city wall and gates, city network, land uses, etc. Uh, and we covered all of that in in all of these cities, uh, and Al Ola is an example, the Haran Janoub an example, uh, Alga Village in uh, Central Najd, Yambo, uh, Domit al Jandal, uh, Wadi Dawasir, uh, Farsan Islands, uh, conventional means, uh, observation, measuring, sketching, and drawings, where students were asked to observe light notes, uh, take sketches 
and draw for, uh, for the things that we're saying. In each settlement, in each site or town or city that we went to, we documented two houses as an example of the Bashar architecture. So these documentation were in the form of plans, uh, elevations, and sections. That in addition to uh, photographs. So uh, not taking and uh, the, the rest of the conventional means uh, were focused on construction materials, spatial distribution, construction techniques, and that was in Asir, Aflaj, uh, and uh, so on, al Ghat, Yambo. Uh, these are examples of the resultant drawings, uh, houses in a uh, house in uh, Farasan Island, another or elevation in Comforta. Uh, Yambo and Najran. Uh, as the fair in Baha, Wadi Dawasir, uh, Haremla, uh, Jof, uh, Tabuk, uh, Jof, uh, Jeddah, that's in a warehouse. And photography was very essential. I know there were some situations that we couldn't reach, like uh, a dire Bani Malik in Jizan. So we had to take photograph from a distance. You know, there were uh, single uh, houses or like uh, towers, you know, inhabited in scattered mountains. So we had to take, you know, we didn't, we tried to use drones, but you know, it didn't work. Uh, and also photographs were essential to record the details of uh, motifs and decorations uh, or the, the aerial view of some size like Alola. And uh, thermal assessment or thermal analysis was also essential because we were in July in Riyadh and higher. We tried to find out the difference in temperature of uh, mud wall inside a house and the asphalt. And the difference was 30 versus 62 at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Also, we used uh, GPS to, uh, for the coordinates of the, uh, the buildings or the houses that we documented. And also, we had to interpret, uh, interpret you know, uh, a strange uh, architecture and urban situation that we found. Like this in Amlaj, we found uh, a, a, a concrete uh, or cement uh, floor added in the top of a traditional uh, coral reef build, uh, st uh, ground floor. Uh, the same thing in, uh, in Hai, we found this uh, uh, mud uh, tower, uh, part of uh, a cement complex, so we tried to find out what was the origin of that tower, or what was the origin of that floor, and so on. Uh, missing space in Duba, uh, half building in uh, Hafouf, undefined courtyard uh, in Hail, uh, collapsed column, cut beam, uh, misplaced column, unrecognized space uh, used in Beni Malik in Jizan, uh, missing boundaries in Hail, uh, lower openings in Maksur uh, uh, to Cemented mud wall uh, and, co and cobra. Uh, original color, we didn't know. We had to find out what was the original color of the door of this uh, building in Taif. Uh, incomplete Roshan in Yambo, foreign figures in Hail. Uh, and also in the urban scale, there were ruined uh, district in Alga, uh, in Najd, and identified urban layout and foreign style in Sabia. Uh, ruined district in Yambo, identified Commercial Street in Dahran al Janoub, uh, Raflaj, Zulfi, Katif. Oral history was very essential in our work, you know, uh, because we wanted to, to hear uh, and know the information that are not documented in books or research. And the only resource was for that was, you know, the, the old people who lived in uh, these houses or these building, uh, buildings or experienced uh, somebody who lived in these uh, buildings. So uh, we met uh, the, the old uh, people and, uh, and all the places that we, we traveled to. Uh, we asked them about, uh, in terms of the urban aspects, the, the world location, the gates, major streets, land uses. As far as for artificial aspects, we asked about the space usage, uh, style, construction materials and techniques, master builders, source of construction materials, and so on, as well as the influencing factors, uh, history, environment, politics, 
economy, culture, etc. And uh, it was a very pleasant experience, not only for me, and, but also for the students themselves, who had to travel with us thousands and thousands of miles by train, by, by planes, buses, and ships, Palestine Islands. Uh, we met people in Fed, and Ha'il, al Madna, and Kasim, al Waj in the north, uh, Jov, Zilfi, uh, Mr. Jed, and Ha'il. And uh, in some places we didn't find any heritage, such as the MAM, so we had to go to the local library, local library uh, or the university library, to see the work or to check the students' work and in search of faculty members to see if they uh, find out if there were any studies in the past. Uh, so in order to, to get some information. Also in uh, museums that, you know, uh, like the ones in Oshager and uh, God, uh, we found some valuable information such as the uh, old uh, photographs and uh, maps. Uh, the outcome where, you know, we produced 90 volumes of reports and that is in at King Abdulaziz University Library. And we tried to publish our work gradually. So we started with uh, a book on uh, Khobra and Maznab uh, of Kasim. Uh, then we published papers, you know, in conferences. We, we talked about uh, Al Ola and Riyadh conference, uh, Jeddah and Oman, uh, Central Region, that was in the journal, uh, Yambo and uh, Buenos Aires conference, Riyadh, uh, we talked about Riyadh in San Diego, Asir uh, journal, uh, Jeddah and Havana, Cuba, Tema and Florence, Palestine Islands, Valencia. Uh, central region in uh, Norway, uh, Jeddah in France, uh, central region in Peru, Domitri Jandel in the uh, United States. And also we try to transfer our experience to encourage other people outside Saudi Arabia to do the same. So we went to, last May I was in Turkey, we, we talked about the project, we, don't, we talked about how we can entice Turkish students to work more on uh, Ottoman sites along the Red, uh, Red Coast, Red Sea Coast. Uh, also, we went to Argentina. We talked about Al Ghat, and we were able to train the local Argentinian uh, adobe regulations. Uh, the, the government there banned uh, the restoration of uh, adobe buildings because of earthquakes that happened in the 50s and killed thousands of people. Uh, but you know, we present the Al Ghat and how the people, the local community, restore it. So that encouraged the local community, the local government, to change the rules or the regulations. In Bari, we talked about also. In, uh, we, talk, we we talk our work to Algeria, Italy, uh, Germany. Now we have we're going to start a new project with the Brandenburg University, concentrating on the Red Sea coast uh, for three years. Also, we went to Cameroon. Uh, so, in general, uh, the TASA, which is the nickname of our project, uh, was the first attempt in the history of Saudi Arabia uh, to scientifically record and survey the traditional architecture of Saudi Arabia or the country. The results of the project uh, have been delivered in the form of uh, reports, uh, published papers and books, uh, various online uh, med media and documentary productions have been concerned. You know, there is a site for our work now. The members of the, pro of the project team uh, have painfully witnessed the, the banishing of very precious buildings and entire settlements uh, that are significant to the regional history and identity of Saudi Arabia. Local community have a fundamental responsibility in protecting uh, the heritage they produced. Authorities should raise public awareness to maintain local heritage. And before I finish, there is a small movie that I want to uh, show. It was produced by one of the students. It's about the geography of the project.
from the beginning, please. From the beginning. To the memory of the traveled miles. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hisham, for this uh, extensive, uh, wonderful documentation of, of a countrywide uh, sort of mapping and documentation process, which really, uh, I think, I think we've witnessed a really beautiful sort of narrative between all three speakers where we went from Mecca to different parts of uh, Saudi to the entirety of Saudi. And it really wraps things up in a beautiful way. Thank you so much. Um, I, would, I would invite you guys to come back uh, uh, in uh, just to have a round of questions. I don't think we're gonna be able to have uh, questions from the audience as we're running out of time. Uh, so um, I'll just ask my own questions. <laughs> Being a little bit selfish, sorry. Um, so I would, um, I mean, I have, I have a few questions to the three of you, uh, and then maybe we'll roll back to, to the main questions that, uh, that really wrap things up. But um, I think uh, I found it quite interesting that Dr. Hisham talked about uh, the oral history as a means of data collection. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how that put things uh, how did it shine a light on the entirety of Saudi in terms of collecting these oral um, uh, stories? Because it's, it's quite a different process from taking photographs and, and, and doing that sort of thing. Uh, I can give you an example uh, of what happened in Najran. Uh, we were there and we were very impressed with the traditional architecture of Adobe, of mud architecture there, you know, it's, it's wonderful. So we wanted to know who, what's the origin of uh, uh, the architecture? Is it linked to, the, to Sada, which is a few miles from it, in North Yemen? And uh, who built these buildings, uh, and so on? So these, these information, such information you don't find in books or research. Only the people who live in these buildings, the old people. So uh, this is the thing that we wanted to know and, and uh, luckily we met so many uh, old people who lived uh, in traditional houses in, in Najran and elsewhere, and we were able to, to get such information. And do you think it affected the, the forms of um, written or drawn or photographed uh, documentation process? Uh, or even yes, mapping? exactly, because uh, in, uh, for example, Layla in uh, Aflaj, we didn't know that the city was surrounded with the wall, so, but we've been told, you know, and we, we, somebody talk us to the location of the mall, of the wall. So we have to, to imagine, you know, the, the gates, the, the gates location and so on. So the oral history was very important, you know, to our research in a way or another. It's really interesting. Thank you so much. 
Uh, do, you, do you have uh, Lesma and George anything to say about that uh, in terms of experiencing uh, oral histories that influence the manifestation of the research that you have done? Sure, just I think similarly uh, to Doctor that we had a number of instances where speaking to local people opened up new sites, especially in Asir, that were not on the beaten track. Um, a lot of people, you know, there's some restored buildings in, uh, in Abha and outside in Rajal al and elsewhere, but it's only when you speak to people that you find sometimes the oldest, the most important sites. Um, but in addition, in terms of the actual physical process of documentation, sometimes speaking to local people helps you understand how the room is meant to have been understood, how it was meant to have been appreciated, and how the works of art or the architecture was, was, was initially envisaged. And that means that you can document it from the vantage point, the correct vantage point, as it were, uh, rather than perhaps this the easiest way. So I think I, I would agree entirely that it's an incredibly important um, factor in accurate recording and mapping. That's more. So, yeah. Um, I think for us, especially in Mecca, it was very valuable to communicate with locals in order to get access to the locations we visited. Um, many of it, uh, like you would hear preconceived ideas of such areas, like similar to Al-Sharashif or Al-Hujun, that are difficult to... Um, for a stranger to come in, they would feel like it's a threatened condition. However, once you start speaking to these people and they inform you of your story and know your intentions, then you get a lot of valuable information and you actually see how um, welcoming they are as knowing that you are actually adding to their um, location rather than threatening or um, causing any distress. That's fascinating. Um, so how do you kind of tie that and you spoke a little bit about I, the identity of Mecca, and how did you kind of decipher the identity of Mecca in relationship to, the re to what everyone has spoken about today and the future of Mecca? The identity of Mecca. Yeah. Um, I think uh, we, in a way, we wanted to be um, open to, once we started this workshop, we wanted to research um, with our students, like with, our, with the participants, wanted to put them through it. As, uh, in a way, we all had a specific, uh, um, we all had a specific um, idea of what the identity of Mecca is uh, through our experience of Mecca, but once you past that boundary of just that pilgrim experience, you're exposed to more of different thresholds into Mecca. So it's like Hello. many cities into one. So the identity of Mecca is a collapse of um, uh, different cultures, heritage, and uh, users of the space. It's very uh, diverse in terms of inhabitants um, with similarities in certain topographies. And you kind of start to connect these areas to one another in close proximity to Haram until further out to the boundary of the sacred boundary, let's say. Um, okay, and then I have a question maybe directed towards George, but it's also directed towards all of you. Uh, and it's about um, uh, this rematerializing artifacts from something that was not there uh, or something that is so preserved that we can't touch to something that becomes so tangible for us to be able to actually even maybe fracture and study and, and look into in a more deep and meaningful way. And that kind of, I think it resonates with identities of cities, oral cultures, different sorts of mapping and documentation. So how do you find that process? And who do you think, uh, how do you think it would influence further studying uh, these things within our society? I mean, from, uh, from my perspective, rematerialization, re especially digital rematerialization, should be the last option. It's much better to be able to preserve these sites and this heritage through co traditional means. And I think that the documentation that all three of us have described is ultimately the, the, the jumping off point for research. By undertaking these projects, you provide data for researchers to then analyze and reach their own conclusions, whether it's on Mecca or other sites across Saudi Arabia. Um, in our case, 
we have this institute in, in El Bela, the Jimmy House of Traditional Arts, where we teach um, a one-year program in the traditional craft, in gypsum carving, in uh, woodwork, in ceramics, and the full grounding in the, in, in the fundamentals of geometry and, and the principles that were designed, or that were used to design and to build El Beled originally. Uh, it's wonderful to have Dr. Sami here, but uh, Ahmed Angawi, who is one of our, uh, well, who's the program director of the teaching element of, the, of what we do at the Jamil House, he pioneered this deconstruction of the language of Mangur to really understand what are the composite elements of Mangur, which then allowed him and now his students, our students, to, to, to revitalize that craft. So that when we see, for example, um, Rawashin and al Belad collapsing, the optimal solution, in my opinion, would be for practitioners of the ancient craft of Mangur to repair them or to produce new ones using that original craft. But if they're unable to, or if the gypsum panel collapses and there's nobody to repair it, then at that point, rematerialization steps in. But, to, but, but again, it's all connected because by having rematerializations, it can inform and help support the learning of those traditional crafts and those traditional practices. Do Besma or uh, Dr. Rajam, do you have any? Um, I think it's uh, Dr. Sami. Um, Uh, thank you all very much. It seems to make me, make me feel good uh, that uh, finally something is going on after 40 years of waiting. I'm very, very happy to see what's going on. But a small uh, adjustment here. Uh, Mecca is not a city. Mecca is not a town. Mecca, that's where you can start a sanctuary, a haram. Well, it has a specific that you cannot cut even is thorn trees, thorn trees. So it gave us the primitives. Another point, the haram is uh, the mosque. This is a big mistake which I sometimes say because we got used to say al-haram. That's the mosque of Mecca. Al haram is the whole of Mecca. And the other one which can give us a, a, a very good urban direction, it is the mother of villages, Umm al-Qura when we talk about the most latest way of thinking about development, they think of decentralizing and having villages. Mecca is already a conglomerate of villages, as it was described. So we really have to dig down in the root. Unfortunately, what is lost, but maybe what is coming now, we have to think of the future of Mecca. The, the history of Mecca is lost. Uh, but is, there are some documents, but the future is what's important. And the word you said, construction, I think there is something opposite. And it's the only place in the world that the bulldozer is, goes before the, the planning or the thinking. So it is time now, alhamdulillah, what's going on, that we're stopping and we are moving in the right direction, finally. By, inshallah, by 2030, we see Mecca maybe gains back its uh, original authenticity but there is many incredible projects that are coming which will finish the future of Mecca if we don't adjust it quickly and review. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sami. I think we went in from, from the nucleus of Saudi to the entirety of Saudi and how this dialogue between crafts, um, ideologies, and analysis, and different forms of mapping really shaped the world that's around us today. Uh, and really gives us an understanding and a newfound respect for the past, but also uh, a, a glimpse towards a brighter future. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers who made this happen today. And thank you.